Good morning and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online in this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Julie Rich and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session from sunny Orkney. And we're going to move over to Shetland now. And this morning's speaker, Brian Smith, writer and editor, is a well kenned face in Shetland, having been the chief archivist there for many years. Brian has many papers to his name and a book on the settlement in Shetland over six centuries. And he continues to write for the Shetland Museum and Archive, as well as co-editing the longest running magazine, The New Shetlander. I'm sure Brian has unearthed a wealth of stories and characters, both heroes and villains. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the remarkable story of John Williamson. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand you over to Brian Smith with his talk, The Shetland Weaver and the Mortal Pox. Thanks very much, uh, Julie. Um, I actually spoke about smallpox to the Orkney Science Festival and John Williamson's campaign against it exactly 25 years ago. I didn't guess and nobody guessed that all of us would soon be embroiled in another catastrophic epidemic. There are interesting similarities and differences in the way that the epidemics affected Shetlanders and in their attitudes to inoculation and vaccination. And that's what I'm going to speak about today. Smallpox arrived in Shetland in the summer of 1700. A young man came home from the mainland of Scotland. He touched in at Fair Isle on his voyage. He was suffering from smallpox. It was a new disease in Shetland, and as a result, the Shetlanders had no immunity to it. It spread like wildfire. In Fair Isle, young people and old began to sicken. Two-thirds of them died, and eventually there was nobody left to manage the island's boats. Later, there was havoc in Lerwick. One Sunday, the congregation of the Kirk there prayed for 90 dead inhabitants. By September, the Presbytery of Shetland couldn't carry out its duties in the parishes because its clergy were too busy ministering to the dying. The dead in every corner, said the minister of Tingwall in December, were so many that the living and whole could scarcely be able to bury them. Now, what was happening in Shetland wasn't unprecedented. Shetland was so isolated that new diseases often had catastrophic results. But smallpox was different and more frightening. The presbytery, fumbling for words, could only call it an outrageous disease. Shetlanders henceforth referred to this first visitation of it as the mortal pox. And in later years, old people calculated their ages from this or that year before or after it. In cities, it was more usual for smallpox to attack infants and children, but in Shetland, it afflicted breadwinners as well. In the little island of Fettler in Shetland, for instance, more than 90 islanders died, most of them, as the minister said, married people. Shetland was unusual, perhaps unique, in its wide-ranging experience of smallpox in the early 18th century. What was the solution? In Shetland in 1700, there was none. All the minister of Tingwall could offer was, and I quote, fasting and prayer that the Lord's wrath must be appeased. The bodies piled up, the survivors, pockmarked, sometimes blind, waited for the next visitation on their children and their children's children. One of these children was John Williamson, who seems to have been born in Shetland. We don't know who his mother was. His father seems to have been called Andrew Williamson. If John was a Shetlander, it's interesting and almost unprecedented that he received his father's surname. 
Shetlanders of that period, whose surname ended in daughter or son, normally had their father's Christian name as part of that surname. John Williamson's own eldest son, Andrew, took his father's surname. That's an occurrence almost unknown in an isolated Shetland parish at that time. It suggests that the Williamsons were modern and progressive, and John Williamson's unusual career confirms that. Shetland in the early 18th century was a society which depended almost entirely on fishing. It was a very poor community. In the mid-18th century, when John Williamson came to manhood, Shetland's 15,000 or so inhabitants lived on about 10,000 acres of poor arable land under the thumb of sundry merchant lairds. They paid their rents in fish. From the late 1740s, perhaps much earlier, the Williamsons lived at Hamnevo in Aishinus in North Maven in the extreme north west of the Shetland mainland. Tenants of Thomas Gifford of Booster, the most pro prosperous merchant laird in the islands, they had a large farm by Shetland standards, about 10 acres of arable land. In 1720, there was a second visitation of smallpox, and once again, it was catastrophic. In Fula, there were hardly enough people left to bury their dead neighbours. And then in 1740, there was a third outbreak that was even more severe than its predecessors. In the years around 1740, the countries of Northern Europe experienced famine and sharp frosts perfect conditions for epidemics, as we know today. In Lerwick, the Kirk Session had to extend the Kirkyard by, 80, by 50 feet and announced restrictions on paupers' rights to coffins. In Fettler, 120 people died, more than in 1700. Later, there was a tradition that the Fettler Kirkyard was filled in every corner, except in the spot reserved for suicides and drowned men. To make things worse, the frost was so severe in the winter of 1740 to 41 that for six weeks the Fettler folk couldn't dig the earth to bury their dead. Nothing brings home the pain and loss of smallpox more vividly than Thomas Gifford's diary. Gifford, as I said, was the Williamson's landlord, a bluff, confident man. In 1740, two of his children, Betty and Frankie, contemporaries of John Williamson, died from smallpox and another three died during its aftermath. This is how Gifford described those fatal days. I quote, Wednesday, poor Betty and Frankie took the bed yesterday morning. 10th, Monday, the pox with Betty and Frankie, very bad. The pox riseth very slow. 12th, Wednesday, the bairns are worse. This day is the ninth with them. 13th, Thursday, the bairns very bad all day, being the 11th of the pox, feverish and weak. 14th, Friday, they were a little easier, but extreme weak. Pox began to fall. 15th, Saturday, Thirteen days with the bairns, the pox began to dry. Sixteenth, Sunday, the bairns very weak and sore, but some hope. Eighteenth, Tuesday, my dear Betty died about seven at night in a very calm manner. Robbie lay all that day. Nineteenth, Wednesday, poor Frankie died about seven at night, very calm. There seemed to be no cure for and no prevention against the mortal pox. At the end of 1740, Andrew Williamson was becoming an old man and he handed over the lease of his farm at Hamnevoe to John. For a year or so, in the early 1750s, they shared the place and in 1752, John entered a new 
lease with Thomas Gifford for the long period of 19 years. John prospered as much as was possible for a Shetlander of his generation. Around the time of his lease with Gifford, he married Christian Nicholson. Children began to arrive, Andrew, James, Christian, George, Barbara. They were born between about 1753 and 1763. Some of them may have caught smallpox in 1760. Some of them may have died because the fourth outbreak of the mortal pox was about to strike in Shetland with its usual chronological precision. This time, however, a solution was at hand. In February 1701, Dr. Clopton Havers had described to the Royal Society the Chinese method of variolation or inoculation the introduction of smallpox into men and women to give them a mild version of the disease to provide immunity. Then in April 1721, Dr. Charles Maitland inoculated an infant in London. The experiment was a success. As a result of these events, there were ambiguous reactions to inoculation in England from the outset. Some people, all of them rich people, grasped at it as a panacea. Others shrank away from it as brutal and irreligious. We know exactly when inoculation came to Shetland. A few cases of smallpox appeared in 1758, and a local gentleman wrote to William Edmonston, a Shetlander who was a surgeon in Leith. Edmonston gladly gave his Shetland correspondents advice. The operation, he said, is extremely simple and easy and the success universally good. The manner of doing it is as follows, he continued, to make a small incision with a lance so as some blood comes away in that part of the arm or leg, then to put in about the bigness of a barley corn or little more of cotton in which the poxy matter, which must be good and perfectly ripe, has well absorbed, then a sticking plaster and afterwards a compress and bandage. The poxy matter must be kept into the wound for 24 hours at least. I commonly keep it in for two or three days. That was the basic method of inoculation, although, as we'll see, there were variants of it. But inoculation was still a treatment for rich men and women. No ordinary Shetlander could afford such an operation. So when the mortal pox arrived in Shetland in force again in 1760, there was not much inoculation in the islands. The disease raged as usual. Ninety more men and women died in Fetlar. But inoculation had come to Shetland to stay. In 1768, uh, a landlord uh, in the south of Shetland was writing to a doctor in the south for smallpox matter for his children. And when a minor epidemic began in 1769, another Lawrence Edmonston, nephew and former pupil of the other, was practicing in Lerwick. He took firm action and he deserves to be known as the first popular inoculator in the islands. He inoculated several hundred people, especially poor ones. There were little signs that smallpox was beginning to falter in Shetland. The fact that an epidemic had broken out in 1769 only eight or nine years after its predecessor, was paradoxically good news. Greater frequency of infection was allowing Shetlanders to build up immunity to the pox. And one source of that greater immunity, 
that greater frequency was the diversification of the Shetland economy from the mid-18th century onwards. A greater incidence of visitors there and a new tendency among Shetlanders, especially male Shetlanders, to travel out of the islands. As a result, the Shetlanders, who had previously been plunged in gloom and apathy by a disease which seemed unconquerable, suddenly became optimists. Lawrence Edmonston told his son that the people of the lower classes were soon convinced of the great advantages and resigning every prejudice to the voice of reason, both young and old presented themselves for inoculation and experienced its benefits. Now, the contrast with the situation in the urban parts of Scotland is remarkable. In Glasgow and Edinburgh, there was massive opposition to inoculation. People railed against doctors who they reckoned were tempting fate and reason, faith and reason by using dangerous smallpox matter. And of course, it could be dangerous. It could give people smallpox and kill them. So why did the Shetlanders take to it with such alacrity? First, as we've seen, they had a worse experience of smallpox than almost everybody, anyone else. It's interesting to contrast the situation in Shetland with that in Orkney. There were no major smallpox em epidemics in Orkney, probably because those islands were less isolated than Shetland. Secondly, and this is equally important, Shetland smallpox had carried away young and old, rich and poor. In Glasgow, it was a disease of children, often poor children, harrowing, of course, but not likely to stop the society from functioning. In Shetland, on the other hand, the huge mortality, perhaps a sixth of the population on each occasion must have caused chaos while the disease was raging. And there can be little doubt that part of the Shetlanders' appetite for inoculation from the 1770s onwards had much to do with the attitudes of local clergymen and landlords. Landlords seem to have cooperated with the inoculation movement. In 1783, for instance, John Mitchell of Westshore tried to organize a mass inoculation of children in Fetlar. The ministers were even more excited. William Mitchell, the minister of Tingwall, inoculated 950 of his parishioners free of charge from 1774 until he died in the early 1790s. Meanwhile, what about John Williamson? By the 1770s, he was turning away from the sea to new interests. Over the next 20 years, he had a remarkable success in a whole series of occupations. He was, somebody said, a tailor, a joiner, a clock and watch mender, a blacksmith and a physician. He began to dabble in inoculation. No record exists of when he first took up his knife. Shetland's age of popular inoculation was the period from about 1770 to 1800, and documents indicate, but documents indicate that John was inoculating uh, far earlier than that. By the 1790s, he'd acquired a remarkable reputation in Shetland. He was, of course, a different kind of practitioner from Lawrence Edmonston or the Reverend Mitchell. He was, as a visitor said, a common fisherman with a remarkable mechanical turn. He was not the only plebeian non-medical inoculator in Shetland, but he's the only one that we hear about by name. Fortunately, the Minister of Mid and South Yell wrote down a detailed account of John's inoculation technique. The first concern of any inoculator was to get a good supply of smallpox matter. 
That could involve travelling long distances to find the promising subject. John Williamson had come up with the idea that it would be less dangerous before use to lessen its virulence, as the minister put it. He dried it in peat smoke and then buried it with camphor. Camphor was antibacterial and therefore prevented the matter from putrefying. A local tradition in North Maven suggests that he put the pus between sheets of glass before burying it. He seems to have collected large amounts of matter because there evidence, there's evidence that on some occasions he buried it for seven or eight years and thus did without the benefit of it for long periods. This self-taught practitioner, explained the minister, finds from experience that it always improves milder to the patient when it has lost a considerable degree of its strength. The next step was the inoculation itself. Williamson, the handyman, rejected a lancet and he made his own knife. With it, he made the smallest possible incision in the outer skin of his patient's arm without releasing blood and inserted a tiny amount of matter. He immediately replaced the skin and, said the minister, the only plaster he uses for healing the wound is a bit of cabbage leaf. Observers noted that the infection always took effect at the due time, exactly as in any system of inoculation. John was using a variant of the Suttonian method, practiced at that time in Essex by his almost exact contemporaries, contemporary Daniel Sutton. Sutton had perfected a method of inoculation which dispensed with dangerous bloody incisions. It's impossible to say now how John Williamson heard about such methods, although there were large numbers of newspaper and book-length accounts of inoculation available in its day, which may have filtered through to Shetland. It's not easy to pinpoint why one system of inoculation worked better than another. It may be that John's deployment of peat smoke and camphor and his elaborate burial of the pus was less important than the lightness of his incision. The late Derek Baxby, who attended the Orkney Science Festival in 1996, suggested to me that the smallpox virus could be sporadically modified by intradermal inoculation so as to produce a milder effect in the individual. Possibly, uh, Derek suggested, the key factor was the growth of virus in the very superficial layers of the skin. But however he did it, John Williamson was a successful inoculator. The minister reported that he had inoculated several thousand people and that he hadn't lost a single patient. Dr. Arthur Edmonston, the son of Shetland's pioneer inoculator, a very prickly and not over generous man, gave Williamson an accolade. Williamson met with such unexampled success in his practice, said Edmonston, that were I not able to bear testimony to its truth, I should myself be disposed to be sceptical on the subject. Had every practitioner, Edmonston went on, been as uniformly successful in the disease as he was, the smallpox might have been banished from the face of the earth. By the 1790s, John Williamson was describing himself modestly enough as a joiner carpenter. An account exchanged between him and Andrew Gifford of Oliberry, whose shop he frequented, survives. Gifford was supplying Williamson with cloth for his tailor work. In part return, Williamson seems to have worked for Gifford for a proportion of the year. Gifford paid him more than £70 Scots, 
for more than 100 days' work in 1791, and part of that work was, Gifford said, inoculation to sundry of my tenants. This suggests that John Williamson and Gifford had a contract for the upkeep of Gifford's tenantry by inoculation. But Williamson was inoculating elsewhere. In 1787, for instance, he inoculated the children of Matthew Ramsey in the island of Yell. That supports the idea that he was an itinerant inoculator. The account between uh, Gifford and Williamson stopped abruptly in 1796, possibly because John died then or had become too infirm to work. Ironically enough, 1796 was the year of Jenner's great discovery of vaccination with smallpox. When John Williamson died, smallpox was under control in Shetland for the first time, but it was still lurking, still a potential killer. In 1804, somebody suffering from smallpox arrived in Lerwick. Almost at the same time, Shetland's first consignment of cowpox vaccine arrived. The doctors got to work and Shetlanders submitted as docilely to the vaccine as they had submitted to inoculation with smallpox itself. Those doctors quickly snuffed out a potential epidemic. But for various reasons, mainly to do with the incompetence by, of other local doctors and also the gradual disappearance of smallpox, Shetlanders of the 19th century began to become wary of the new method. Uh, between 1841 and 1861, for instance, there was only one death from smallpox in the populous parish of Dunrosnas. As a result, there were fewer and fewer vaccinations. On the eve of the Vaccination Scotland Act of 1863, which made vaccination compulsory, <coughs> a local medic reckoned that a third of the population of Shetland was unvaccinated. The Act naturally changed things. It's my impression that there were next to no prosecution of defaulters under the Act in Shetland. But 50 years later, the situation was entirely different again. In 1922, Shetland's medical officer of health reported dolefully that, and I quote, the population here is notoriously unvaccinated. About 94% of the population, he said, is unvaccinated. <coughs> Why was that? First, as I've suggested, as time passed, Shetlanders saw less and less smallpox. 18th century Shetlanders, confronted by the mortal pox, had needed no persuasion to inoculate to save their skins and the children's skins. But in the 19th century, Shetlanders saw less smallpox. They got vaccinated when they remembered and eventually when they were forced to do so by law. It became possible in due course for uh, Shetlanders to become, uh, to, to, voluntarily uh, object to vaccination and not to have it. And that's what Shetlanders did in the early 20th century. Nobody seems to have written down precisely why he or she objected, but I suspect that Shetland's anti-vaccination feeling in the early 20th century was an amalgam of repulsion from cowpox perhaps some religious scruple, and most important, attentiveness to individuals, particularly children's rights. These conscientious objectors weren't idiots like COVID vaccinators and Eric Clapton at the present day. They were simply people with various types of scruple. And eventually the situation changed again 
in 2021, Shetlanders and Arcadians are probably better vaccinated against COVID than people anywhere in the world. For the past 50 years, there has been no smallpox in the world. I sometimes have a feeling that Shetlanders today regard John Williamson as part of heritage rather than, than as a nimble-minded Shetlander who was on the side of life rather than death. But John and his colleagues changed things. They helped to turn the tide of history in their native islands. They deserve our attention and love. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, what a fascinating talk and what a remarkable man um, John Williamson was. And gosh, that was just, you know, sounded horrific for the communities um, that it affected. And it seems to be, have been generational as well. Um, we've got a lot of questions. Um, do you know, I mean, this is a, a, a funny question. What percentage of the population were affected? I know there was quite a few outbreaks, but do you have any idea, you know? Well, during the period from 1700 to 1760, which was when smallpox raged in Shetland, especially in 1740, we are speaking about a sixth of the population. Now, that was, of course, catastrophic for the individuals and families concerned, but in another sense, it was catastrophic for the community because people simply were not able, to, as we had in one case, to man the fishing boats. That's, of course, I might say cynically, why uh, the merchant landowners became so interested in inoculation. Uh, they wanted that uh, diminution in the working population of Shetland to, to, uh, to falter and stop. Uh, so it was a huge, it had a huge impact in Shetland, more so, as I suggested, than in most parts of the kingdom. Yeah, and another a question from Rich kind of um, touches on that, you know, um, you know, what happened to the, you know, the fishermen, the, the trades, you know, um, people that would, you know, normally visit Shetland, did people stop coming? You know, how did people get what they needed? Well, you see, in this period, in the early 18th century, we had a situation where people weren't normally coming to Shetland for trade reasons, although some did, of course. We had a situation during those decades when Shetlanders were uh, taking fish out of Shetland. Now, there was danger in that situation, of course, that they would bring back smallpox with them, and no doubt that happened because there was so little immunity in Shetland um, to, to smallpox uh, during the first half of the century that people were likely to get it if they were um, if, if they if they uh, came into contact with any manifestation of it. Um, and you also touched on um, you know the differences between like Shetland and like the urban areas. Do you think the living conditions were the sort of main cause, or you know, or was it just purely because of the sort of isolation of Shetland? Well, the isolation of Shetland may, meant that Shetlanders were were very likely to uh, to to get the disease if they came in contact with it. I suppose one difficulty might have been that the precise details of infection were not were simply not understood. Um, you know, if people if somebody with smallpox coughed in the vicinity of uh, somebody without it, that person was almost certain to get it. Um, I don't know if there's much evidence that Shetlanders knew exactly how to avoid it. Yeah, and, and, and even the, um, the inoculation, um, when it first came about, it sounded pretty grim. And, you know, was there quite a risk of infection? There was a ris risk of infection, and there was also a risk of blindness uh, resulting from even a milder infection. Um, but it looks as if John Williamson and other inoculators in Shetland um, managed to convince the population that despite the risks 
they should go ahead and have it. And given that John Williamson's own method seems to have had such good results and um, not result in uh, major danger, it seems to have convinced the Shetlanders that this was the thing to do. I mean, I would have done it. <laughs> I know. It um, just sounds, you know, just you know, really, really bad, and to, to just move through the the family, and the, there was nothing they could do, you know, before the inoculations. Um, Eric Walker's asking, what was the mortality survival rate before and after the inoculation? I know you said that John only had one death. Well, he didn't have any deaths according to, oh, sorry. to yeah. Edmondson. Um, well. I mean, we don't have those figures for the period after inoculation, but the fact that the population of Shetland began to advance steadily from the moment of inoculation onwards uh, suggests that it was very successful indeed. Um, I mean, it's not... Some historians have suggested that um, John Williamson might have started inoculating in 1770 and the population was rising steadily from 1980. That's absolute nonsense. You know, it couldn't have worked as quickly as that. But there's no doubt at all, as I suggested, that people like John Williamson had a remarkable effect on the, um, the incident, you know, on the Shetland population. <coughs> Sorry. And there has there been much written about how John... <coughs> sort of learned, you know, these things by himself? You know, was he well read or, you know? Well, you know, unfortunately, these things are always a mystery because he didn't write down anything at all. And uh, all the stuff that was written down about him by the Minister of Mid and South Yale and by Arthur Edmondston, that is all that was ever written about him. So we on, we can only reconstruct his campaign from bits and pieces here and there. Um, I wish I wish we had, we knew a lot more. And um, we've got question, another uh, comment from Eric Walker. Um, he says that, you know the peat smoke, um, plenty of that in Shetland. Um, he says uh, would have contained considerable amounts of phenolic compounds, which would act as sterilants. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but I'm interested to hear it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, do, do you think it was just an experimental thing that he came across the peat smoke? Um, because it was just... Well, you know, I, I, I suppose he was experimenting, yeah. I mean, one of the things that surprises me is that he experimented with burying the, the matter for years, seven years, according to these accounts, but because, of course, that meant, as I said, that he had to do without the benefit of that pus for uh, a long time. But, you know, he seems to have been willing to do that sort of experimentation. And I, and I guess he would have gotten the trust, you know, being a local as well, you know, from, you know, people when he started, you know, word of mouth. You know, one thing that I didn't say during this lecture, and I deliberately didn't say it, is that in Shetland, at the time and ever since, John Williamson has had uh, a nickname, Johnny Notions. And the reason that I deliberately didn't mention that is that I don't like that idea very much. It appears that he got the nickname from people who thought that he was, John Williamson was doing, you know, barmy things, um, you know, that he had bizarre notions. Uh, so I expect that there were Shetlanders who thought that he was a bit crazy, but on the other hand, a very much larger number of Shetlanders who realised in due course that he wasn't. I think that this reputation would have been great, even among people who are a bit baffled about the things that he was doing. And has he been recognised in any sort of way? Well, no, he hasn't. Um, 
the only memorial to John Williamson is absolutely bizarre. Uh, he was buried in the Kirkyard de Deshness in North Maven, and presumably because people admired them so much, they dragged an old medieval runic stone from elsewhere in the graveyard and put it on his grave. That's the only memorial that he has. And I think there should be a proper memorial to him and his fellow inoculators. And I think that, you know, spurred on by this occasion, I, I might propose that. Yeah, I think that would, that would be that would be lovely because um, it's kind of it's almost like an unsung hero, you know. If you hadn't found you know the writings from those other people, mm -hmm. we might not have known about him. Yeah, that's great. And um, I was kind of struck by the similarities um, between what's happening now um, and what happened then. You know, with people's attitudes towards um, vaccinations and things. Yeah. I mean, I had to skip through that rather fast, but it is very, very um, strange the way that Shetlanders change their mind about these things from time to time. A friend of mine called Logie Barrow, who's a, an expert on anti-vaccination movements, has pointed out to me that that alteration from complete inoculation in the 18th century to um, people forgetting about the vaccination and then becoming um, skeptical about vaccination in the early 20th century in a big way is really unprecedented anywhere. We all know from uh, COVID that there are some bizarre ideas around about vaccination. You only need to read the Daily Mail every day uh, to find that. Uh, and we had, as I said, Eric Clapton and Van Morrison singing blooming anti-vaccination songs. Um, you know, there is still a huge amount of bizarre... I, uh, there are still a huge amount of bizarre ideas on the go about this subject. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think because there's a lot of unknowns to people, so um, you're always going to get different opinions. Yeah. And hopefully the, the smallpox is, you know, gone from Shetland. Um, I hope there's nothing buried in the, in the peat hill anywhere. I doubt it. No, smallpox has gone entirely from the world. And... Um, I believe, uh, I'm not quite clear about this, but I believe that polio has also uh, gone from the world. And of course, the reason that these things have gone is that dedicated and selfless men and women running vaccination campaigns have managed to eradicate these terrible, terrible diseases. Yes, I think we should we should all be very grateful to to all these people, you know. Um, and it sounds like John was a bit of a pioneer himself. Um, and Rich has suggested that he needs maybe a, a blue plaque at the very least. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you, Brian. That was um, a great um, talk. Thank you for um, being with us today, and thank everybody that's out there watching us. Um, Please join us today for lunch at 12.45, um, where you'll be getting news on the North Ronaldsea's application for the international dark sky status. And guests will include some of Scotland's new um, astronomer royal, Professor Catherine Hamans and Ashley Wilson of the International Dark Sky Association. So do join us if you can. And if you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details on how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and follow our YouTube channel. Hit the like button, subscribe. And remember, we've got the Festival Club later tonight, um, starting at half past nine. So we hope to see you there as well. So thanks again, Brian, and um, that's goodbye from me. Thanks.